What if the number one thing you could do to improve mobility, performance, maybe flexibility, uh, is change the angle of your feet when you walk? All right, we're going to take a look at that and a whole lot more in today's conversation on the Movement Movement Podcast, the podcast for people who want to know the truth about what it takes to have a happy, healthy, strong body, starting feet first, because, you know, those things are your foundation. We break down the propaganda, the mythology, and often the outright lies you've been told from, frankly, big shoe about what it takes to walk or run or play or hike or do yoga or CrossFit, whatever it is you like to do, and to do that enjoyably, efficiently. Did I mention enjoyably? That's a trick question. I know I did. Because look, if you're not having fun, do something different till you are. You're not going to keep it up anyway, if it's not a good time. Uh, I'm Stephen Sashin, CEO and co-founder of ZeroShoes.com, your host of the Movement Movement podcast. We call it the Movement Movement because we're creating a movement. We'll talk about that in a second, about natural movement, letting your body do what it's designed to do and showing people, helping them rediscover that that is the obvious, better, healthy choice. The same way we currently think about natural food. And the first movement is involving you. It's nothing you have to do. You don't have to pay anything. There's no membership card. There's no secret handshake other than just sharing what you discover about natural movement. And one way you can do that, go to our website, www.jointhemovementmovement.com. You'll find the previous episodes, all the ways you can interact with us on Facebook and YouTube and Instagram, et cetera. Um, all the ways you can download the podcast into th different places. And look, just, you know, you know what to do, share, like, thumbs up, review, et cetera. In short, if you want to be part of the tribe, please subscribe. So let us jump in. Kelly Start. Um, it is a pleasure to chat with you, and I'm going to let everyone know we should have started this conversation a half an hour ago because that's when you and I started it, and we just could keep going for hours. But here we are. Um, for the five people on the planet who currently don't know who you are, tell them who you are and what you do. Oh, boy. Great dancer, uh, connoisseur of cookies and ice cream. Look, I am a physical therapist by training but I'm a strength and conditioning and movement coach. And what I would say is I've actually spent a lot of my, a bulk of my time thinking about how we can help people take care of their own bodies. And whether that's, how do I get out of pain myself? How do I improve my position mechanics? How do I self-soothe? We're really trying to help launch and, and continue to nurture this revolution about you being able to understand what's going on with you. I love it. Now, before we jump in, um, I have to confess something. The last time you and I talked, which I think was in what, 1927, something way back when, we had this great conversation. Um, I recorded it. I was planning on doing really neat things with it. Um, we got off. I hit uh, save and my computer crashed and I lost the whole thing. And I emailed you and told you that. And we basically have had almost no conversation since then. And I was convinced that you were like, you know, thought I was snowing you in some way or mad at me for something. And I knew I was making this shit up in my head, but nonetheless, I was so upset because it was such a great conversation gone into the ether thanks to the magic of computer technology. So I'm um, thrilled. Well, the good news is that we are much more reasonable men, reasonable people now, and we have even more experience so we can actually try to solve some of these problems now. I think it's fine that you said more experience instead of saying, dude, what happened to all that gray in your hair? Where'd that come from? <laughs> Ended up in my beard is where it happened. Yeah. I, luckily, I can't grow a beard because if I did, it's all gray. It's really crazy. Um, that's what happens apparently at 59 and a half. At least that's what seemingly happened to me. So let's jump in and talk about you know what I teased things with about feet. This is a really provocative thing about some things you've discovered about biomechanics. And I'm going to let you just lead. And I know I'm going to have a bunch of questions that I'm going to ask you once you start doing that. One of the issues I think is that we are all having a conversation about what's the fastest way up Everest? Which equipment do I take? What do I carry oxygen or not? And meanwhile, no one is at base camp yet. We don't have bodies that are durable and sort of done all the preparation for exercise and or for performance or going long or kind of straining ourselves. And one of the things that ends up happening a lot that we witness and in the in, in high performance environments in which we work, which is everywhere, we see that people are coming in with complex, either complex behavior solutions, complex technology solutions on top of complex behaviors. And that means that like, oh, we need to, we have a fitness problem and a health problem in America. Everyone gets a Peloton. Ah, that just doesn't scale. It maybe, maybe is incomplete thinking. Certainly Peloton can help us out of this thing a little bit, but it's maybe an incomplete thought, right? So 
what is it that humans need to do? And more importantly, what are the places where I can recognize that a lot of people are really busy, that they are working at their limits of their available capacity, they have jobs and families, they're trying to do the right thing, they're trying to make better decisions. So how can I constrain the environment so that's not another thing I have to do. I don't have to go through some foot activation program, but that my environment is nurturing my positions. It's nurturing my tissues. It's nurturing my movement behaviors. And it turns out that learning and practicing to stand with your feet straight and walking with your feet straight means that when we start to add speed to that, when we start to add load or intensity to that, it's a behavior that my brain has practiced for thousands of reps. And if you want to have a foot that works well, then you're going to need to have that foot be straight when you walk, when you stand. And again, this isn't about pain or no pain, because that certainly can be an an ongoing run-on aspect of, of having incomplete foot function. But if you want to have the miracle, the full bounty of the miracle of your big toe, of your plantar fascia, of your ankle, of your hip extension, having your foot straight is going to at least unlock that potential to you. So again, this isn't a conversation of poverty, like, oh, you're above the poverty line, great by $1. I want you to have full access to the miracleness that are your feet and body. So one of the things you can start doing is practicing standing and walking with your feet straight. And it turns out you can walk with your feet turned out like ducks your whole life until you want to run fast and run far or cut or jump and land your strongest position. So there's a great saying, you know, that one of our friends, our coach says, there's more variation in waltzing than there is in sprinting, which means that low load, low speed, we can buffer a lot. But when we start to extrapolate that out, when we start to go long or start to go fast, you'll see that the best functions and methodologies of how the human body functions, what our physiology says we should move, it all starts to approximate. And guess what? The fastest runners on the world walk and run and jump and land with their feet straight. It's interesting. If you watch, um, I had this conversation with Nick Romanoff who created Pose Method um, for running. And we, we were talking about this and we pulled up a video of Usain Bolt running in slow motion. And you're looking at his form and it's impeccable. But then you look at the other seven guys in the race. And except for the guy who was last, um, which was still running super fast, they all had the exact same form. You know, the better you get, the more it just goes to whatever that ideal is. But let's start with two things. One, for many people, just they don't know where their feet are pointing to begin with. And I know the fact that we've already said this sort of poison the well, if they're going to stand up, they're going to adjust their posture a little bit because they want to do it right. And they want their feet to be pointing in the right direction to begin with. So, you know, can you give people an idea of something they could do? I'm imagining like close your eyes, march in place, stop, and then take a look at your feet or something to see what their natural, their, well, I don't say natural, their habitual position is before we talk about what it's going to take to move them into something feet straight and more effective. Well, the real question is why aren't your feet straight now? That was, that's that was really where I was going next. You right? jumped ahead, man. So, you know, really, you know, ultimately let's look at movement as a behavior right? And that's a choice. And sometimes it's an unconscious choice. Uh, we say that humans will you know, default to their conditioning. They'll default to our most practiced behaviors, your most practiced positions. It's almost like we can say practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. And we know the key to adult learning is repetition and that a child has to do something over 10,000 times. You know, they'll fall and cruise and sit and stand. There's a lot of tolerance in the system. And the, I think the foundational issue is it's okay to turn your feet when you need to cut or you're walking on a weird surface or you're uneven. Like that's why you're supposed to have all this variability so that you can walk down a riverbed and have to make your feet fit where they were. But when we're standing, we want or lifting or moving or practicing with intention, we cultivate what we call a reference foot position. And that reference foot position is that if you just find yourself standing, and by the way, yoga calls this Tadasana, right? It's almost like we've done this for a long time. You should be have 50% of your weight on the ball of your foot and 50% of your weight on your heel. And then you should be able to put your big toe on the ground. And if you look down, your ankles should be in the middle of your feet. So if your knees come in, your ankles are now on the inside of your feet. And if you pick your big toes up and roll on the knife edge, your ankles are now biased towards the outside of your feet. And so if you just look down and put your ankle so it's not too far in, not too far out, but right in the middle of your ankle, right in the middle of your foot, that's called subtalar neutral in the world. And if you're balanced front to back, you now have a fantastic reference foot position. In that position, 
you're going to begin to have all the access to the incredible physiology. So for example, one of the reasons that you'll see that everyone on the planet who is into performance either starts at the pelvis and ends at the feet or starts at the feet and ends at the pelvis, right? You, it doesn't matter where you go. And eventually you're going to become obsessed with feet and obsessed with breathing. Like there's just like, there's the pathway of the, the modern. Oh, don't, hold on. Don't leave, don't leave your butt out of that, the equation. Cause you're going to get obsessed with your glutes as well. Well, ends up being a, side, a little side piece. Yes. You realize that you can't have your glutes unless we talk about what's going on with your feet. Correct. So check this out. One of the things that we have a poor understanding of generally culturally is how our spines develop stability. Mm. And we have, we have like, trust me, we have been bracing the core for 10 years at least. We have working on core strength and it doesn't seem to have mattered very much. So let me give you a mechanism for how this works. It's not just rock solid abs that makes it work. Your pelvis is sitting on top of your femurs. And you have these two balls of, and sockets. And so imagine that your pelvis can just wobble around on your femurs. The way that your body creates stability is not by making your butt pull down and making your quads pull forward. And then you're in some kind of tug of war with two long ropes. It's through the rotation developed by the femur to pelvis relationship. So everyone's heard of the rotator cuff of their shoulder, but you know, you have a rotator cuff of your hip. You have six rotators. In fact, I think you have upwards of 13 to 18, if I'm wrong, muscles that externally rotate your leg or have a movement that externally rotates your leg. Now, this is important because even the connected tissue systems of your leg create an automatic passive external rotation. What I'm saying is by external rotation, if you lay on the ground and you're taking a sun bath, you're laying in the sun, your feet will, your toes will fall apart. Your legs will kind of fall out to the side. That is the connective tissue systems of your body unwinding. Yep. And so that's that tensionality, that torsion is automatically opening up. So when you stay with your foot straight, one of the things that happens is you automatically capture these mechanisms of winding that makes your pelvis stable on your femur, which makes your lumbar stable on your pelvis and your thoracic spine stable on your and up the chain. And so what ends up happening is that if I'm forward too far or back too far, then I'm going to have to make up for that sway in the system. I'm going to have to push the rope a different way. If my feet are turned out, I can't access the power of the musculature, the power of the connective tissue winding that makes my pelvis stable. So we can't talk about your pelvic function without talking about your feet. And I can't talk about your feet without looking at, is your pelvis in a cattywampus overextended compensation position? So there are some base organization positions that work pretty well when we want to go fast or under a big load or a long way. If you look at the triple jumpers in the Olympics, not a single one of them, that's probably the most force anyone can possibly take off a single leg in any sport. So you're seeing these superhuman people run down and jump, triple jump on one leg, boom, boom, leg, leg, leg. And all of them have defaulted to a foot straight position where the arch doesn't collapse, where the knee isn't valgus, because that's the only way the system can actually create enough stability for them to create force. And so by constraining that system on a single leg, you'll see they don't have this choice of staying with their legs out. So what's interesting is that so many of our modern behaviors where we're not walking a ton or sitting on the ground, or we don't have dynamic, strong feet, and we're in these sensory deprivation coffin feet, thank you, you know, um, uh, muscles and meridians, Philip Beach. And the idea here is when we begin to help people by constraining the system, hey, when you get a chance and you can think about it, get your feet straight. If you're washing dishes, just practice your feet straight. When you're walking, just try to bring some consciousness in a while. Then don't worry about it. You're going to need lots of reps, lots of behaviors. And pretty soon that becomes your default learning so that when you want to go fast or sprint across the feet, street or pick up a 5K, it's not one more thing we're going to have to train you out of. I had a conversation this morning with Dr. Isabel Sacco in Brazil. She did a study where she took elderly women uh, over 65 who had knee osteoarthritis and put them in a super cheap minimalist shoe. And she wanted to do something super cheap because it was available in Brazil and studied them for six months. And at the end of six months, one of the first things she said was one of the results was they went from having their feet turned out to having their feet straight. And I said, did you look at glute activation as well? She says, um, yeah, their glutes were working better too. 
And so I'm curious if you have any thoughts about if someone's going to practice walking with their feet straight, obviously, I mean, you and I agree, you know, barefoot whenever you can, but if that's not going to happen, what might people, um, what might help people do that? Or, Or in other words, I'm thinking, let me back up and do it this way. I had something going on with my right leg where it was externally rotated a bit. And someone gave me an exercise where they had the idea that somehow I'd be able to relax enough where my foot would come back to being straight. And after weeks of doing this with no effect, I just forced my foot straight and tried to see if I could relax into that. And I did. And then it was solved in 20 seconds. So I like forced my way there and then found a way to kind of chill out. And that made it change. Do you have any suggestions for people who want to, who notice their feet are turned out who want to experiment with walking that might make it not necessarily easier, but might, you know, we talked about you and I talked about Moshe Feldenkrais before that might give their brain the information that it needs to make that adjustment more effortlessly. There's a million ways into this, right? What I like to think of is sometimes the brain is so clever that if you give it more degrees of freedom, it will automatically do the right thing. Mm. So let me tell you what I mean. So I work in all levels of professional sports. And let me, let me, one of the things I don't do when I'm working with athletes and teams is I don't adjust technique. If you have a running coach, it's your running coach's business to teach you running. And I'm not ever as a physio or performance coach or strength and coach going to give you running advice. My job is to get you prepared to be able to receive the information that your coach is teaching you. So what it does is that it gets me out of hot water because I'm not arguing about how this NFL quarterback should be throwing the ball or yeah. how this you know, Cy Young Award winner pitcher should be going or how this skier should be skiing. What I do is restore what it is you should be able to do, that we move and teach to the highest expressions of the movement. So one of the ways that we can begin to do that is by saying, well, do you have access to your native physiology? I'm talking about the range of motion that every physician says you should have on the planet, every physical therapist should have, every chiro, every napropath, every osteo, every kinesiologist. Everyone agrees that within a standard deviation, unless you have some weird congenital thing going on, which happens very, very rarely, really? very rarely, you know, what you'll see is, you know, that everyone has has about the same range of motion within about five degrees. And that five degrees doesn't matter. That's that's irrelevant because you are missing 100% of your range of motion in certain ranges, or excuse me, hyperbole, 80% of your range of motion in these ranges. So what ends up happening is that your brain, when it starts losing movement choice and options, starts to shut down potentiation. It starts to shut down your ability to access positions. And so your center of balance is a little bit off or, or you can't react as quickly. And it's because your brain is, again, the most sophisticated structure in the universe. So one of our hypotheses, which we've been running forever, and remember, I'm a classically trained physical therapist, and so range of motion matters is that when we restore people's native ranges or help them move towards those ideals, and what I'm saying is not Simone Biles gymnast craziness, I'm talking about basic range of motion, then we don't have to have a lot of these, this is my Kung Fu grip, this is your Kung Fu grip style conversations because suddenly what we're doing is reintroducing choice to the brain. And so here's a simple way of thinking that. We tend to see as modern people that we do not spend a lot of time with the leg trailing the body in like a big lunge position. Mm -hmm. We call this hip extension. So if I stood up from a chair, I'm extending the hip, but taking the hip where my knee comes behind my butt like I'm sprinting, that's hip extension, right? And it turns out that most people are highly deficient in hip extension. You'll see it if I look at your total movement language for the day, You may walk around a little bit and your hip is going, your knee is going behind you a few, but it's not going towards its native range of motion very much, the limits of its native range. So yes, it's important that you spend some time there and learn how to control that. We have things like lunges and isometrics and a whole host of millions of ways of training those positions and shapes. But ultimately, you can't get into that shape whether you want to or not, actively or passively, because you're stiff or your brain's trying to protect you. Both things are valid. Right. So what ends up happening is that people don't recognize that when their foot comes down when they're running or walking, that foot started from somewhere and it started behind your body. So if you don't have the range of motion behind your body, then what you're going to do is you're going to spin out that foot 
to compensate for that position. And so as you start to stride over the foot, the foot will turn out or stay turned out. And then you'll end up swinging around. And when you come through to put your foot down again, guess what? It's no longer straight. And it takes a very conscious person to straighten their foot at high speed. In fact, I would say it's impossible to do that. And so what ends up happening, right, is wait, that wait, wait. I you I gotta, have... I got to tell you about that. Uh, when I was in the lab with Dr. Bill Sands, former head of biomechanics for the U.S. Olympic Committee, he films you at 500 frames a second when you're running on a treadmill. In this giant treadmill, it's like five feet wide, 10 feet long. You're in a mission yes. impossible harness in case you face plant. So, you know, you hover over the ground instead. And he said, I said, why are you filming at 500 frames a second? He goes, you can't get any information at anything less than that. The last two frames, so one 250th of a second, my right foot was everting about 15 degrees. And there was nothing I could do consciously about it. I didn't even know it was happening. And what was going on for me was I'd had a bunch of hamstring pulls. And so I had this, the tightness part that once I resolved that, it all went away. But to your point, it's like, yes, yeah, some of this stuff at high speed, it's just so wired. You can't consciously do anything. So back. No, to- no, you're absolutely nailing it. And nor should we have to be consciously right. thinking about, right. Those are called running drills that we do for practicing positions for five minutes because we turns out human movement is skill-based. Running is a skill, right? That ultimately we want to work on and refine and work on and this red eye and this marathon jumping afterwards and sitting at my desk for this deadline may have altered my range of motion temporarily. So I'm trying to reclaim that through my movement skill, movement training, movement practice, movement prep. So what ends up happening then is when we start to see that my start position is actually dictated by my finish position, then it's going to be really difficult for me to understand why I overstride, mm. why my arch hyper collapses. Yes, there's pronation that happens in the foot, but not when the foot is under your base of support. If you put that foot way out in front of you and give it an hour to collapse, it will take an hour before that foot goes to its end ranges of the seatbelt, hangs on all the ligaments, you've power stretched all your you torsion, your plantar fascia, your posterior tib is locked down. And then you're trying to put pulse on that. Your big toe doesn't work. You can't spring off this thing. And all of a sudden you're like, I don't know why I'm so slow. Why am I so slow, coach? Well, it turns out you cannot run your fastest over striding, hitting a brakes. So one of the things that we do, for example, when we work with runners is we'll constrain the system. We automatically say you have to run at 96, not 94, not 92, not 90 cadence on the right foot, but 96. I make them so high that they can't actually overstride off the back, right? So I, I make it so that their stride rates comes up. They get spring air. They're powerful. Of course, 90 is fine on hills. When you're a skilled master, you can do whatever you want. But when we immediately say, okay, well, it's going to take a second to improve your hip extension but let's constrain the environment so that we have a better foot contact because now we're talking apples to apples, not apples to oranges. And you can imagine that now we're seeing a shifting sands of a human being being continually molded by the amount of sitting we're doing, the lack of exercise, the lack of sort of hip extension. And then all of a sudden we are like, fitness is cool. Running is cool. Everyone can run. It's so rad. By the way, I have the shoe that has some magical control that when you come sliding in, The shoe will be there to prevent you from going through the windshield. And all you have to do is think about it in those terms enough. And you're like, well, that's kind of a crazy sport I engage in, right? I find out what the limits of my tissue tolerance is. And can I find the right biomechanical cushion to limit this technique error? So what I'm saying in shorthand is if we start doing some, we call it the couch stretch. It's a position we invented. You can Google couch stretch and do it while you're watching TV. It just works on, it's an exaggerated running hip extension position. You can do Eldoas in a hip extension position. You can get into a lunge. You can just lunge and squeeze your butt. But what you've also talked about was that if you can't extend your hip, one of the things that first turns off is your glutes. And so if your hip is in flexion or flexion bias. That means your hamstrings now are doing what? They're extending your hip and flexing your leg. That means your hamstrings always are doing that, but now they have to do the work of the butt. No wonder you're a runner with a flat butt. You can't extend your hip because your hips are so short in the front or you don't have access to your hip extension. So when we teach hip extension, we also teach it with, let's be able to, can you practice squeezing your glutes there? So the faster you walk, the faster you run, It's your glute that's predominantly driving your hip extension and that springiness. 
It's not just your hamstrings doing double duty. And that means your pelvis is more stable, your, pel your, your lower limb functions more effectively. And all I did was give you your hip extension back. And sometimes when we're talking about all these complex behavior modulations, I'm like, hey, do you notice that you can't squat all the way to the ground? Isn't that weird? You can't squat and take a poop in the woods or lower yourself to the ground or sit cross-legged or extend your hip. And yet we're arguing about what the fastest way up Everest is. So let's get you to base camp first. And then we can, you can take any way up Everest you want. Then we can argue about what shoe you like the best or which shoe is the cutest or, or which training te template allows you to handle the most volume. I don't care about that stuff because we're arguing based on these logical fallacies underneath. So I got to say two things, Thing or maybe three. Thing number one, for anyone listening slash watching this, um, you're going to want to, first of all, I got to do it this way. Kelly, um, I need to give you an award. You're the only person I've met who talks at least as fast as I do. So um, <laughs> it's a pleasure for me, but I'm, and you know, people have said to me that they listen to most podcasts at double speed, except for mine. Um, so I'm going to suggest that people go back and listen to this at like half speed because you threw out so much so quickly that, I mean, even if you're taking notes with, you know, and you've got a, and you're a stenographer, you're, you're going to miss, people will miss a lot of the subtle little things that you said, which is totally dreamy. And I want to throw out a variation on um, what you just said about using your glutes for walking and everything we were just talking about. When I quote, teach people how to walk. I give them a drill to do or something to play with. I go, think about being a skater. So when you're skating, you use that one foot that's on the ground, that's actually active to drive back, to drive your heel back. That's the thing that moves you. You've got one foot that you're sliding on and a foot that's pushing back, that's moving you forward. So let's do the same thing when you're walking. I say, lift your, like, your left foot slightly off the ground, half an inch off the ground. Don't do anything with your left foot. Leave it there. Don't lift it. Don't put it in front of you. Leave it alone. And now like you're skating, push back with your right leg and just use your left leg to keep you from falling on your face. And then repeat on the other side, lift your left, right leg slightly off the ground, push with your left leg, and then just use your right leg to keep you from falling on the ground. And then, you know, make it look a little less mechanical and a little less robotic. And just basically, this is just training people to start using their glutes as the prime mover for walking. And eventually it becomes much more subtle, but then you notice you're walking and your back doesn't hurt. Your knees don't hurt. You're kind of gliding along a little more. It looks like you're having a good time when you're doing it instead of, you know, kind of pogo sticking from one leg to another, to another. And, and like you were saying before, then that's going to go, if you're going to start at the glutes and go down to the feet, that's one way of doing it. Start with the feet. You're going to start feeling the glutes. It's a two-way communication. And to hundred percent. Yeah. And to your point, it's like, until, you know, one of the things that's really interesting to me about humans uh, and by interesting, I mean, annoying as crap is that if we get some minor injury, we forget that the goal of our body, if you will, is just to get back to the point where we can survive, not get back to the point that we were pre-injury. So these little things we do, I mean, little things can get us um, having some little imbalance or some little tightness or stiffness or, or, or uh, laxity that if we don't pay attention to, we'll habituate to it. We're not going to notice it. And then it's just going to get progressively worse as we work around it instead of getting back to the way it should be. And like you were saying, getting back to the basics, I like the idea of basics and base camp, getting back to the basics to make sure that everything, the fundamental stuff is working properly before we try and do the heavy duty stuff that is just much more refined that you're not necessarily ready for. And of course, the biggest problem is we're not going to know we're not ready for it unless we do something to check and see where we are with those those basic movement patterns, that basic flexibility, that basic mobility. I agree with all of that. And, you know, one of the things that I really liked, I stuck, stole from a running coach from 84 Olympics, she would have her athletes speed walk an 800 before oh, they ran. I love it. And, and the reason is you don't actually require a lot of glute recruitment to walk. It's because the glute is the biggest, strongest muscle in the body. People can squat, you know, 1500 pounds, 1400 pounds. That's not hyperbole. They squat a lot. They can deadlift yeah. a ton. That butt is really, really strong. Look at our sprinters. Why do our sprinters have such big, strong, beautiful butts? Because they use that butt to extend the hip. So walking quickly is a really easy way to sort of upregulate the demands of your glutes while you're walking. And it's an easy way just to remind yourself. I love your walk drill. And I used to say, I'm like, squeeze your butt as hard as you can and walk. Just take 20 steps like that. 
every like minute or so and you'll be like, well, my butt's burning. And all we're doing is just trying to remind your brain that your butt is actually Use back it. there, yeah. right? It, you'll just, it's there. But that 800 meter walk before you go for a run, walk quickly and you'll be like, wow, I can feel my butt working. Otherwise you may not. One of the things that we try to help people understand is that we have a, I have a concept called positional inhibition that you're not weak, but in some positions, you don't function as well as other positions. Mm. So here's a test you can do. And I'll give you two examples of what I'm talking about. I'm going to have you stand up and stand with your feet straight. And you can imagine this if you're doing this, you stand up while you're listening. And all I want you to do is try to rip a hole in the floor. So pretend your feet are on dinner plates, but they have to be straight. The right foot will go clockwise. Left foot will go counterclockwise. But don't do it from the foot. Do it from the glutes. Try to do the whole chain. And your job is to try to create as much tension and torsion as you can. Okay, great. Now turn your feet out to 30 degrees which is a, a reasonable standing position for a lot of people. Now try to create the same amount of power there. And what you're going to see is that you can't as that hip moves externally, as I mechanically unwind it and put it out, I put those hip rotators into a position where they don't have a lot of efficacy, where they don't have a lot of purchase on the system. So I become positionally inhibited, that positional mm -hmm. inhibition. And so when my feet are straight again, oh, I'm so strong. When I throw my feet out, I'm wow, I'm super weak or less effective. Now, that's a good example of, hey, I can begin to access my functionality when I start to constrain the system. And in this system constraint, I'm talking about, for example, if I don't want to eat cookies in the house, I don't have cookies in the house. If I want to have better glutes, I just stand with my feet straight and I'm suddenly going to automatically have that. And don't get me wrong, it may be uncomfortable initially to practice right. standing. So don't worry about it. Do what you can, move around, do what you can, move around. But there's another thing to notice when people do that is watch what happens to your arch when you do that. Because for all the oh, people- Oh, stop, that stop. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Let me just say this on record. I have never met a human being that does not have an arch. People have little arches, right? People have some arch, but we have taken a room full of, this is not hyperbole, 800 people in a room. And we teach them how to create this passive rotation. And what you realize is that the arch is connected all the way up to your butt. And that when you actually rotate that system, everyone creates an arch. So even the most flat, horrific elephant feet all of a sudden have an arch. And again, it's not a huge arch, but it's integrity back in the foot. So you're absolutely right that we're making decisions about losing some of the springiness. The Russians say, when you stop jumping, you start dying, right? The Russians have a concept. Nikolai talks about springiness, Dr. Romanoff in his book. And that springiness is a concept of, I need to put my body into a position where I can leverage my bony mechanics, my fascial mechanics, my, my muscular mechanics. I need to be able to have all of those things working to help me be springy. When you run slower than 90 contacts per minute on one side, guess what? You're not able to tap into those fascial spring systems as effectively as you do when you're at higher cadence. This is one of the reasons why we like a higher cadence. And higher cadences automatically happen with people when they run barefoot. Here's another test around glutes, because I want you to have choice so that if you're running and you don't need a lot of glutes, fine. But if all of a sudden I'm like, sprint, and you can't find your glutes, then that's a problem. I want your brain to be able to you know, uh, get into that turbocharger. So we do a jump rope drill all the time. I'm a huge fan of jump roping. And I jump rope with the feet together because it forces me to land with my feet straight. And it forces me to teach myself to land on the ball of my foot and to be springy. It's an easy way to practice spring this. So I jump rope every day as part of my biking part before I warm up to run, before I warm up to push a sled, before I run up to lift. I always jump rope. When you're jump roping, see if you can, one, continue to breathe through your nose while you're jump roping. That's an important skill. And number two, you're not going from breath hold to breath hold. See if you can make a choice about squeezing your butt or not. And mm -hmm. if you're jump roping and not squeezing your butt, you are landing when you're running and not using your big shock absorber to absorb the weight of your body. So I want you to be able to choose. Now, look, you don't have to jump rope like a cobra flexing its hood at 100% butt squeeze, but I want you to be able to choose that amount of butt squeeze. If I needed it, I could have 100%, but I'm just going to trust my body will use as much as it needs. And so we use those kind of tests in this position. Can you squeeze your butt? If you can't, 
get into a position where you can. Okay, that's a position that allows and, and gives your body more movement choice and more access to its native physiology, which means it's more robust, and which also means it can run faster or longer. Well, and, and FYI, I used to be a competitive jump roper. And so it, you, you nailed it again. We're talking Not about glutes to feet and back because when you watch people jumping rope, if it looks like they're landing and then having to recoil and then jump again, rather than bouncing off the ground, you know that their glutes aren't engaged. And so jumping That's rope right. should feel like you're a drop of water, you know, hitting a super hot plate. It just bounces off. And that's a weird analogy. I couldn't think of anyone better at the time. Um, that was annoying, just watching my brain come up with a crap analogy. Uh, but, you know, what are you going to do? But, you know, I mean, it really should feel like, you know, hot potato, like you're barely touching the ground um, rather than landing, jumping, landing, jumping. And the only way you can do that is if you're, if you're using your glutes or if your glutes are making you a taut spring by being engaged that's right. before, before you think you need them. And that's why we don't. I don't want you to think about your glutes while you're running. I want you to yeah. think about other things. I shouldn't have to think about that. When you're under heavy load, I don't need you to be worried about, are my glutes working? It doesn't work. I want you to worry about, can I keep up with this person running next to me? Can I sprint ahead and win the, win the championship and the love of this beautiful person? You know, so much of what we talked about today is here's what we know about best function. Now, stay with me for this, this logic jump. I talked about reference foot position. Ball of the foot in 50%, ankle 50%, heel 50%, foot straight. Now put on any shoe in your closet once you've been barefoot and, and organize that foot position and see how your foot, your shoe is either pushing you out of that reference pos foot position or sustains that reference foot position. So if you put a shoe on, all of a sudden you feel like you're falling off a cliff or you're unbalanced or there's a twist in your arch or your weight is thrown onto your toe or your something is then that shoe is not a great shoe. The best shoe on the planet is the shoe that does not interrupt your foot function and your feet being able to perceive what's going on with the ground. How much cushion you need or how hard the durometer of the shoe is depends on the surface that you're on. It's a variable idea. But if you're, I do this with a big high school once a year, I go up and work in this high school and I always make the kids take their feet off, shoes off, we do a squat drill. I have them run and then I have them put their shoes back on and they're like, whoa, gross. Oh my gosh, I can't feel anything. I'm being destroyed. Look at my foot position. My pressure's off. And I'm like, okay, now run kids. And they're like, no, I'm not putting my shoes back on. Don't make me do it, Dr. Starrett. And I'm like, okay. So that is an easy test. If your toes are compressing, if you're being driven, and it's interesting that all the shoes behind you pass that test. Yeah. So there are a whole lot of shoes on the market actually that do pass that test. But if you're looking for a good shoe, stand barefoot, feel, bring your awareness, slip into any shoe on the planet that you like, that makes you feel pretty, makes you feel handsome, makes you feel like a person and not interrupt. And suddenly what you can see is, hey, this is a fashion implement. I'm yep. going to wear this with this jeans for two hours. It's not going to wreck my body, but that is not the shoe I'm going to live in day to day or try to practice my, my function in because it's asking me to do something. It's like your car is always pulling you to the left. That's so annoying. Why is my always car drifting to the left? That's the, the analogy like a, like a water droplet, always going to the left on the hot plate. I like that you, you gave people permission to, uh, let's say, wear shitty shoes for temporary periods of time. The, um, we have a, I had a, a yeah, couple of- those are bike shoes and ski boots. Yeah, like yeah. You have to wear oh, crappy shoes another one. as well, right? We have, we have a couple of professional hockey players who reached out and said, yes. just so you know, um, we've been wearing your shoes when we're off the ice and we're skating better now because when we were in our boots, you know, it was destroying our feet because we weren't able to move them at all. And then we weren't doing anything about it afterwards. And we just got progressively weaker. And now it seems weird that we've gotten stronger from wearing these shoes or more accurately from using our feet. And we're actually skating better, even when we're in a position where our feet can't move, which I just love. Nailed it. Yeah, it's a fun one. Um, look, I know that you've got to go and we could keep doing this forever. So we're going to do a part two. But before we pause for that, and I don't know when we'll do that, why don't you tell people how they can find out more about what we've been talking about, what you've been doing, and how they can engage in this process of getting back to natural and base and base camp before they, uh, well, it doesn't matter you know, where you are now. I had a weird flashback. Back in my All-American gymnast days, my coach, who was a brilliant, brilliant guy, still is, said uh, during one summer, he goes, uh, we're going to work on nothing but roundoffs this entire summer. 
It's like, what? I'm already like, you know, one of the top gymnasts in the country. What are you talking about? He's, yeah, but you got some little form things that are going on. We need to clean those up before you're going to be able to make it to the next level. And I was furious because I wanted to work on all these amazing things that summer. And all I did was like nothing but round offs. And then without doing anything else, when we got back to the other stuff I wanted to do, I was instantly able to do it. So no matter where you're starting, going back and checking to make sure the basics are in place is critically important. So that with that lead in, tell people how they can find you and start discovering this for themselves. Yeah, I'll just dovetail on that. That's really important that when we start practicing better function in all our movements, you know, the gym has been very confusing, especially for runners, because basically what ended up happening is we're like, get stronger have bigger physiology that will make yeah. you a better runner. Like, Oh, just put a bigger engine in the car. Just yeah. oh, how many cylinders do I need? Strength is never a weakness, more cylinders. Right. And yeah. what we're realizing that the strength and conditioning is actually coordination and practice training. And we're looking for transferability. And so one of the things that I'm doing all the time, your coach did this by practicing this position is that he was able to clean up or address or improve mechanical efficiency in some of your landing positions, some of your other things. And lo and behold, that transferred better. Yep. That's why good squatting, maintaining your arch and maintaining your balance between front and back makes you a better lander on one foot, makes you a more effective runner, makes you more effective cyclist. So all things improve and sort of support all things. That's That was really the, the message in that story, which I want people to hear. You don't have to be a gymnast. You have to practice and practice is what physical practice meant. And if you go to yoga and you pay attention to your feet, you're going to have your mind blown at how smart that practice is. It's really evolved. If you jump into a Pilates class and really know what's going on with someone's foot, you're like, Joseph was not messing around. Joseph knew some <laughs> things here, right? So we are, if you've ever been into a gym or a Kairos office, a physical therapy's office, you may have run into a book there called Becoming a Supple Leopard. And that book is almost 10 years old. And that what really was about how can you make your body, how can you own your own physical health and restore your positioning? And then really, it's also about what are those principles look like in the formal language of strength and conditioning? So we now, our business is called The Ready State. We are at The Ready State on Instagram, on the YouTubes, on the socials and things. And on the readystate.com, we actually have a two-week free membership where we'll teach you how to do the basics of taking care of your tissues. And you can cancel after two weeks and have no subscription. But in two weeks, you'll be spun up enough to be able to say, hey, something hurts. That's not an injury. We define injury as I can no longer occupy my role in society. I can no longer occupy my role in family or recreation. That's injury. Everything else is not injury. So everything else, if you're in pain, that's your body's request for change, which may mean, hey, I wonder if something's stiff. I wonder if there's something wrong with my technique. I wonder if I was underhydrated or underfueled or overly stressed. So when we start treating pain just like lack of wattage, lack of output, couldn't make my splints today. We went out, your coach has prescribed these splits. You can't hit these splits. I'm like, what's going on with you? And you're like, why well, eat five pizzas and drink 16, ounce, 16 beers and watch Dune last night? I'm going to be like, okay, one to one. I see these inputs and outputs. But if your knee hurts after run, you're like, oh, I have knee rabies. I have no idea. I'm injured. Oh, that's not the truth at all. So when it becomes so bad, you can't go to work or be occupy your role in the family, that's an injury. Everything else, let me be very clear, is not injury. It's information. So on our site, we're going to teach you how to self-soothe. And sometimes that's just making your brain change its mind about what's going on with your body. Sometimes that's a little myofascial input to restore a position or restore how something slides. There is a lot of reasons why something can hurt, but that is the low bar. Really, what we're going to show you is how you can reduce the session costs from your running so you can run more or do whatever sport you want to do more. Or we're going to show you how you can relax or self-soothe or restore your range of motion. And all it takes, honestly, to begin this conversation is 10 minutes a night, a ball and a roller. We have lots of techniques and lots of more advanced skills. But you could start with the things in your house to be able to have a conversation about your skill, your awareness, and even your perception of your body. Because you said something right. 
Sometimes I need to remind your brain what your butt does. That's why we do this butt walk thing that we were talking about, right? Well, if you lay on the ground and put a lacrosse ball and just scoot around on your butt, your brain's gonna be like, oh, butt, look, I can feel the butt. You're on the butt, that's the butt. And guess what? When you stand up, your brain's like, hey, there's a butt connection there. I still got it. So some of this is just bringing awareness and input into your, into your brain. If we can just do that, we'll begin to start and foment a serious revolution. I'm looking forward to when, um, how do I want to, first of all, thank you. And secondly, what's so interesting to me about this conversation, in the same way that we talked about, you can start at the feet and get to the butt and start at the butt and get to the feet. At some point, we got to start at the brain and get to somewhere. And then we go up to the brain as well. And we we forget that part. And there are a number of people who've done this. We mentioned Moshe Feldenkrais is one, um, and there are a number of others. But it's so it's so fascinating to me how much of the restriction or limitation or problems that we run into are not physical per se. It's just that the brain hasn't gotten the information that it needs to go, oh, you want to do that? Oh, okay. I just didn't think that was safe until right now. 100%. You said it best. Your brain knows that the position will generate force or absorb force or is a safe position. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, it will find a position. Look, I know we're trying to wrap up, but when we see kids with cerebral palsy, they actually rotate the leg, slam the knee in, collapse the arch, into rotate the hip, shoulder does the same thing, elbow flexes, wrist flexes. And guess what? Mechanically, very stable position, that child can now generate a lot of force off that position. When we have children with altered aspects of their brain that makes motor control or movement control more difficult, the brain still has a movement solution for those children. They navigate the world just fine. That's how incredible your brain is. Yeah. So when we start to give information back, like if you look, last piece of homework, if you look at the homunculus, which is the sensory motor representations of the brain for different parts of your body, your face and lips are huge. Your brain has a lot of power because we need to be able to understand what's going on, emote and chew and feed and speak. Your hands, number two, hugely important, your hands. And guess what's number three? Your feet. How weird is that? Genitals are pretty big, but so are your feet. And what I'm telling you is that when you start to feel more through your feet, suddenly you're like, oh, is that why I do that pebble walking? And is that why I stand on the spiky mat? And that why wearing barefoot starts to make my back feel better? Because sometimes you're just not getting input into the brain and your brain is looking for input all the time. And so all I'm asking for is a return to sanity, return to input. This is the thing I say all the time. It's like, you know, you have more nerve endings in the soles of your feet than anywhere but your fingertips and your lips. It's not an accident. You're supposed to be getting information from that to your brain. So your brain knows what to do with the rest of your body. And if you can't feel it, you know, numb feet or dumb feet, and it makes the rest of your body do the same. And it's the simplest thing to say. And what's so fun for me is watching people, if they take off their shoes or if they're putting on a pair of zero shoes, that look on their face like, oh my God, because their brain is just waking up again to, right, that's what I've been looking for. And sometimes it can feel overstimulating for a while because it's just you know, oh, yeah. information um, and it's just, you know, it can be a little overwhelming, but once you get used to it, it's like, you can't go back. When I, when I walk around town uh, in bare feet, which I do a lot, in fact, um, if I'm wearing shoes, which I do sometimes too, I wear mismatched colors. I was in Costco the other day in line at the um, pharmacy and a guy behind me says, Hey, your shoes don't match. And the pharmacist says he's wearing shoes. <laughs> and, um, but when I walk around barefoot, um, people ask me sometimes like, well, why are you doing that? It's actually my favorite. When kids say, why are you doing that with their, when they're with their parents, I go, um, is it fun when you take off your shoes and walk barefoot? I go, yeah. I go, it's still fun for me too. It's like, it's just so interesting. Even if it's not pleasant, pleasant, it's just so interesting. And that's what's so engaging. That's what makes it so entertaining. And then I also say to people- Last, what, last, last anecdote, Lee, I, I got to cool. jump in because okay, go. there is a great study in Norway and they were like, why are these kids so behaved? What's the success of this classroom? And it turns out the kids took their shoes off and were barefoot in the classroom. They did and in guess Japan what? Too. They behave, lo and behold, it makes better kids. Yeah. Maybe because they feel like they're at home, maybe because they're getting better sensory input. Who knows? But I guess what? I mean, I think you're really onto something there. And uh, I'm not going to lie. I picked up my children barefoot at school, in elementary school for a long time. And it made people uncomfortable for a long time. Then they were like, oh, that guy. 
That yeah. guy, the barefoot guy. One day, one day I was walking, we had an office in East Boulder and I'm walking into the office and I could see my reflection in the window and I'm wearing kind of ratty shorts and a zero shoes t-shirt that I'd worn way too many times. My hair was particularly big that day and I'm in bare feet and I see my reflection in the window and I stop and I go, oh, I'm that guy. <laughs> Yeah, you become that guy. I'm that guy too. Go train barefoot. You can swing kettlebell barefoot. You can go press barefoot. You can go lunge barefoot. Just get a little more input. You yeah. know? And um, you know, I think what you start to see again is what is the body supposed to do? Yeah. How can I not interrupt that system? I need to walk more. I need to get sunlight. I need to sleep. I need to eat whole foods. I need to feel right? I need to psychomotionally have good relationships and my body needs to feel what's going on. Then we can ask what's next. And yeah. when you start to get into those, those basic conversations about that, then it doesn't feel like such a big psychological leap. And what you're doing by asking someone to be in a more flat shoe where they can feel more doesn't seem like such a, a fringe experiment. I say to people when I'm walking around barefoot and I do it in the winter too, and people ask, why are you doing this? Um, or they make some comment. I go, would you ask me that question if we were at the beach? And they say, no. And I go, well, just pretend we have post earthquake beachfront property in Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> I will steal that. That is amazing. Stephen, thank you so much, man. I really I love Glad talking to you. Me. All right. Well, for everyone else, first of all, thank you all for being here. Thank you again, Kelly. Check out his website. Check him out on Instagram and YouTube and all the rest. Uh, I look forward to hearing what your experience is when you do. And again, go over to www.jointhemovementmovement.com to get previous episodes, find out everything we're doing. If you have any suggestions, by the way, people you think I should chat with on the show, including people who think I'm completely full of it, I'm open for that, uh, or any requests or comments, whatever you got, you can drop me an email, move, M-O-V-E, at jointhemovementmovement.com. But more importantly, go out, have fun, and live life feet first.